Welcome, Devrup, uh, and thanks a lot for joining me today. So, for the viewers, Devrup graduated with his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the University of Buffalo, and then he also completed his master's in mechanical engineering from NYU. And since the past five years, he has been working in the U.S. So, Devrup has gone through the entire process of uh, being on a student visa, working on uh, doing internships on the CPT working during the OPT, on the OPT, as well as now he is currently on an H1 visa. So I wanted to have a quick discussion with uh, Devrup to understand uh, how the process works about uh, how what happens when you actually decide to start working in the US about the CPT process, the OPTs, what can you do and what you are not supposed to do, as well as uh, the process of the H1B visa. So Devrup, I'll just uh, let you do most of the talking. So. Sure. So go ahead. I mean, you. Start. you can just tell us uh, about what, how the process works, and what are the rules and regulations when it comes to working in the U.S. Yeah. So when it comes to working in the U.S., when the student first arrives, they are mm -hmm. only allowed to work on campus for at least the first nine months, because right. when you're on an F1 student visa, your official permit to be eligible to work off campus is starting after the first nine months, which is technically like the summer for fall intakes, mm -hmm. summer of the following year. And that also has to be in a field which is directly related to your field of study. Okay. And for that, you need work permit, either through the CPT, which is the curricular practical training, or there is another permit, which is known as pre-completion OPT. So okay. I had that situation when when I was a student at NYU in my department, the CPT wasn't being offered. Okay. So I had to let go of some summer internships because there were lots of discussions whether the CPT would be implemented or not, and that didn't happen. Okay. But I again got an internship in the in my last semester before I graduated, mm -hmm. and that was in New York City and. Myself being a student at NYU, my school was also in New York and most of the classes happened in the evening. So during the day, I was allowed to work 20 hours a week off campus, but on a pre-completion OPT. Okay. Now, there are good and bad things about it. The mm -hmm. first start with the bad thing, which is if you're working part-time, which is 20 hours per week on pre-completion OPT, that gets deducted from your overall OPT period. Okay. So let's say you work four months from January to May part-time on pre-completion OPT. So that is taken as two months of full-time OPT. So after graduation, okay. instead of you having 12 months of full OPT, you'll now be having 10 months of OPT. Okay. So that is something students need to keep in mind because with the H-1B situation being a lottery, if you take the first 10 months and then the STEM OPT starts immediately after the regular OPT expires, mm -hmm. students might not get the third chance to be in the H-1B lottery right. because their same OPT will also expire. So that is one gamble I took because I badly needed the experience to, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I knew I wanted to get into the industry, but all the entry-level jobs also needed some sort of an experience just to okay. see like what we knew. So I took that gamble and it paid off because I got my H-1B in my first year itself. Okay. So... So, I mean, well, just for, uh, yeah. on that note, uh, Debru, if I understand correctly, the pre-completion OPT that you're talking about, you can apply only in your graduating semester. Am I right? You can do it in the summer as well. Okay. You can do it in the summer as well. Okay. Because yeah. I was under the impression that uh, you can apply it only in your graduate, I mean, the semester that you intend to graduate. Okay, no, but you that, can apply good, anytime, good just that it's similar to a regular OPT process. Okay. In the sense, you will have to apply two or three months in advance so that the EAD mm -hmm. card comes mm -hmm. in time. It was not as straightforward as a CPT where things are quicker. Correct. Right. The CPT is kind of issued by the university itself, right? You don't have to... I mean, the permit is issued by the university, but then some documents are still being sent uh, to the USCIS. And I believe you'd still need a EAD card for that. Oh, okay. Uh, with, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you need some sort of an employment authorization document. They give an IS stamp in the I-20, but the right. entire mm -hmm. process by the school is very quick regarding okay. this. Mm -hmm. Fine. And then after that, you uh, when you started working, your employer filed your H-1 
in the very first yeah uh, so i started in the month of we graduated in may so i started okay. in the month of june so for that year i had already i wasn't eligible to get into the lottery so i filed right, for the right. next year mm-hmm. and i got picked mm-hmm. in the first chance by okay. god's grace so that helped right but what happens when you don't get picked in the first chance is there some kind of i mean obviously your your company would apply in the next chance but uh, what yeah. i wanted to know is that uh, is there a priority given to those who don't get picked in the first attempt and are applying in the second attempt or it's all again like a fresh lottery it's like a fresh lottery again just that if you have a master's degree you get that extra 20000 i mean you get a chance in the extra 20000 20, which right, is right right yeah. right but because this is your third attempt or because this is your second attempt there is no priority given to those There's who no, have applied nothing uh, priority no priority in that case so every time it's a fresh lottery again although Yeah, correct. But oh, okay. here in this case, I recommend students to start applying very early because mm-hmm. I've seen like in the tech fields, uh, companies tend to give the offer very early. So if you are graduating mm-hmm. in May, sometimes companies give offers in October and November of previous year. Yeah, Although right. you'll be starting after graduation, but what the companies tend to do is, since the offer is being rolled to you, and if you have accepted it. then they tend to put you in the lottery for the next year even before you graduate okay. on the basis of your bachelor's degree quota this is for people who are coming for their masters okay it won't be elig- applicable for people coming for the bachelor's because you need to have a bachelor's degree to be eligible for the h1b correct right but and the good thing is that let's say you get picked your h1b still doesn't kick in until the october of that year when you're graduating Correct. So for the three months or four months, you will be on OPT, and then your H one B gets picked. I mean, H one B starts. It starts right. So that way, students will have four attempts. If you mm-hmm. think of it in a that way, I've seen a lot of companies doing that for a lot of people I know who are in tech, and some of them even got picked. Okay. While many of them didn't get picked as well. I mean, it's a lottery, so it's not in anyone's hand. But you at least leverage your chances and give yourself an extra chance of getting picked. Uh, right and and this year again uh, as far as the h1b applications were concerned uh, they said they will have another round in august or another uh, but i think that never happened right they would have um, another round of applications that they would accept talks, in august but yeah i mean i haven't heard of like this year i read that there are close to 800000 applications which I mean, the eight hundred thousand registrations were done, mm-hmm. out of which mm-hmm. only eighty-five thousand were picked. So that is like you're having a success rate of about ten percent chance. Oh, okay, it was to that high. I, I thought that number was somewhere between two hundred to two fifty thousand. Or that this is- year it was lot. I think it was seven hundred ninety or so, but rounded okay. up to close to eight hundred thousand mm-hmm. this year. Yeah, Every right. year it's increasing, but I think till last year or the year before they have had multiple rounds. Okay. Even. Uh, even after the first round was uh, selected because the first round is done only on the basis of your registration okay once you're picked in the lottery then only you submit the rest of the documents which didn't used to happen when we were applicants right yeah i mean earlier uh, you had to submit all your documents make an application and then yep. the lottery happened but i think now right. it's uh, just on the basis of your registration Yeah, it's a like a ten dollar fee which companies pay, and you're being registered, and then if you're picked, then the rest of the application goes through. Okay, mm-hmm. right. And again, the the application happens, and I mean the applications open in April, first of April. So yes, I mean the registration. Once the registration ends, they give like an announcement, or usually lawyers, immigration attorneys of all the companies get to know. Mm-hmm. Once the mm-hmm. final decision has been made, that's when they start asking for more documents. Okay. So students okay. should keep them prepared so that there is no delay in getting the, uh, I mean, the final verdict, whether it's mm-hmm. being approved or not. All right. And and what happens? Uh... in case you don't get i mean you have three attempts uh, let's assume and in all the three attempts you don't get picked so what options generally do, do students uh, have after that so some students i've seen they get enrolled in a program called day one cpt correct uh, mm-hmm. not a lot of schools offer very few schools offer that mm-hmm. and they get enrolled in some program like data science or project management something of that sort but it's also out of your own pocket you have to pay the tuition right, right. Mm-hmm. just that you're allowed from what i know i mean i'm not don't quote me on this but from what i know you're allowed to work on that 
uh, work as you are working while you are also attending school as a student. Okay. So you get probably a couple of years more time to get selected in the H-1B lottery. But that's another, like you're spending more money to give yourself a couple of more chances because you still need to pay the tuition. Right. This is one thing I've seen students doing and some other students have also been I mean, they have been helped by their employers to relocate them to another location because yeah. many companies have global offices. Some move mm -hmm. to Canada, some mm -hmm. move to UK. So they try to move them there and still be a part of their own organization. Mm -hmm. And how many students generally then, you know, I mean, because something that students do is also try for PRs in another for Canada or some other European country. Is that also something that students commonly do? Or what is the trend kind of? I mean, I've heard few people going to the Canada route, but mm -hmm. that is again like first on a work permit and then they go through the PR process. Okay. I'm not uh, familiar with the timeline of the Canadian PR, how it works, but usually I've always heard it's quicker than the US uh, permanent residency process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything but, is quicker than the US PR process. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at the moment, yeah, I mean, unless you are on an EB1A category on the green card, you are looking right, at a right. 12 to 15 yeah. years mm -hmm. timeline. Right. Uh, and uh, generally, I mean, uh, um, okay, so the uh, third option obviously is to return back to India, right? I mean, if you or can... change to another status. Uh, uh, I mean, I think you can still change to a tourist visa status for some time. To buy yourself more time to look for an employer if you can find somebody. Mm -hmm. So that is another thing. But again, that you can can't work. be working on a tourist visa status, right? Yeah, you can't be, but you can find an employer and they need to sponsor you for H1B. Correct. And right. unless you are like these, these are usually like uh, these should usually be provided by the immigration attorneys. They can suggest a lot more okay. as to what are the different ways to chalk out plans. Right. But I've seen the Canada and the other countries route to be more prominent for students or for employees mm. per se who don't get picked in the lottery. Yes, and and I mean of course uh, another option that students have is then apply for a, the second degree, which again has to be a higher level degree. So if you have already done your masters, then maybe if you enroll for a PhD, PhD then yeah. again after completion of the PhD, you get a, a three-year OPT. So, yeah, so for the three-year OPT, yes, it needs to be a complete different degree. It can't yes. be a second master's second degree. It master's, has to be a PhD. Right. Right. Because in second right. master's also, you get just one-year OPT because it's in the same level. Okay. It has to be in a different level to get the other STEM OPT. Okay. Now, do you even get the one-year OPT? Because if you have already used your three years, I think you don't get even the one-year OPT after the... No, I, 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 if it's a different degree, I've degree. seen people getting that. I mean, that's what the rules used to be. Okay. I mean, lately a lot of things are changing. So, but I've mm -hmm. I've seen people getting the third degree as well. I mean, enrolling themselves for the third degree to get more extension to okay. work. Fine, fine. But but how is how are the job scenario right now? I mean, as, I mean, given all the the layoffs and uh, other market conditions, are the students still getting jobs, or you know, there are some sectors that are doing good, some not doing good. Any any idea inputs on that? So from what I'm noticing everywhere, the tech industry has been affected the most. Okay. I mean, tech companies are doing huge layoffs and that's not just for entry-level roles, that's all across the board. Like I've seen people with many years of experience also getting laid off from the company. Okay. Some, so, I mean, I think I read yesterday or the day before that people were given offers in some companies and those offers were taken away even before they have started. Correct, like right. their background yeah. verification and other things were done, but even before the role started, their roles were taken mm -hmm. away. So the tech industry has been affected quite a bit. Okay. In our industry, which is the consulting or cons in the construction sector, like I work in the MEP sector, which is mechanical, electrical and plumbing fire protection okay. in the building mm -hmm. industry, that hasn't been affected too much yet. I mean, in my company, I haven't seen layoffs Actually, okay. I mean, people are switching. They're moving from one company to other, which is part of the job. I mean, the career progression. Okay. 
Okay. But I haven't seen too many layoffs in our industry. The tech industry has been affected the most. Okay. And that's also affecting the entry-level engineers who are graduating fresh mm-hmm. because A, they don't have any experience and second, they need the H-1B sponsorship. Okay. So a lot of entry-level engineers told me that there are few companies who used to sponsor entry-level candidates before and they have stopped doing that currently. I mean, they're all looking for experience. Okay. Fine. So, so just to recap, I mean, uh, uh, so when you start doing your master's or even a bachelor's degree, if you want to do an internship, ideally, you are supposed to do that on a CPT. That is your curricular <laughs> practical training. And then after you graduate, uh, you effectively get one year of OPT, therefore, which of course you'll have to apply before you graduate. And on the completion of your first year, if you have a job and your degree was a STEM degree, you can get a two-year extension on that OPT. So how easy or difficult is it to get that extension or it's just a formality that you apply and if you have a job of you have a job in place, you get that extension. Um, There are two things, I mean, which are very basic, but it's important. First is on a regular OPT, you can still be employed somewhere without getting paid. It can be an unpaid job, but that's only for the first year. Okay. But from the second year onwards, you need to have a job which is fully paid and it has to be per the labor laws. I mean, it has to be at least the minimum wage Mm -hmm. for that location, for the designation and the company has to be E-verified. You're right. E-verification is something, I mean, it's not a very difficult process. I've seen a lot of companies who are not E-verified, but they tend to have a few candidates who are international students, so they become E-verified for them. It's a very simple process for them. Mm -hmm. So these are the Mm -hmm. two basic things that you need to be on when you're on STEM OPT. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then after that, uh, your company files while you're working, your company files for your H1 and... H1. Right. So by the time your OPT expires, you need to have the H1 in place. Yes. Before, uh, I mean, if you're in your last year of OPT and if you're still waiting for an H1B decision to come, Mm -hmm. there's something called a cap gap. Okay. So the cap in the cap gap period, you can still remain in the US and possibly work as well. But once the decision comes, okay, whether you're approved or not, if you're not approved, you'll have to leave the country immediately. Else, right. if it is approved, then you can extend your work till the H-1B starts. Okay. And you can continue working on H-1B from the f- first date, which is usually 1st of October. Okay, fine. And the H-1 is again, uh, renew is general, general term of the H-1 is three years. Three years, yep. Right, which can be again renewed for another three years. Yeah, so total of six years, right. that's what they say, but every three years it has to be renewed. Right. But in this first three-year period also, let's say you change your job. Okay. Then since you're within the first, since you're within the six-year period, company can, the new I-797 a document, which is the work authorization document mm-hmm. they give here, that is also valid for three years. Okay. So in that six-year period, you can... Uh, change jobs multiple times and still get your H-1B like I-797 approval document up to three years as long as it's within the sixth year period. Okay. So, I mean, if you change your jobs, it's just that the employer gets changed, right? So you don't have to apply for a fresh H-1. and no, It has to be through an H-1B transfer. So it transfer. doesn't have to be a lottery, okay. but it's the exact same application, exact same process, everything the same. Okay. Just that okay. uh, you don't need to go through a lottery. So it's, a, I mean, it's a guaranteed thing, just that it takes a little bit of time. Okay. But companies, okay. if they're in a hurry, they also pay the extra fee to the USCIS and do a premium processing. Okay. That way you get a decision within 15 days when you're okay. doing the transfer. Mm-hmm. So, but then again, your duration is still six years, right? Even if you change jobs. Correct. Yeah. Your, your premium H-1B period is the first six years. During which your employer needs to file for your uh, the next step, which is the green card application. Right, right. And and generally, green cards take a longer time. So, is there? I mean, obviously, there are stages in the green card. So, if you clear, what stage do you have to clear to just that you can just continue working in the US uh, without having to leave, even if your green card decision is pending? Yeah. So. 
before your sixth year period expires, there are two steps. One is called the, so there are multiple steps, but the first step is when the companies submit a premium wage application, a prevailing wage application to the Department of Labor, okay. just to make sure if you are getting paid properly or not. Mm-hmm. Then there are a couple of other steps in which I think advertisements are required to be put to make sure that you are the candidate who is being hired and that nobody else is getting uh, hired for that role okay. for that company mm-hmm. but they still need to put that job advertisement that you are the one who's being selected mm-hmm. and after mm-hmm. that the perm sort of perm uh, process is started okay. so if the perm process is completed i mean and this is what i know within your 6 years period of h1b being expired then you can extend your h1b on a yearly basis till okay. you get your green card oh. and the second step after the perm once the perm is approved the second step is i140 application okay. if this i140 process is also approved before your 6th year of h1b expires then you get to extend your green card i mean get extend your h1b for 3 year extensions till you get your green card oh, okay so that's why let's say you have a secured job and you know you're continuing there okay. it's always recommended to start the discussion with the employer very soon Okay. just to make sure that i mean the uh, more steps you get done sooner the earlier you are going to get your green card as well right but again of course for students who are just starting going to start their masters in this fall that yeah. is a little too early to little to, yeah to <laughs> think about or even worry about yeah like but this is exactly the general timeline like okay mm-hmm. So, anything else that uh, you think you would like to add uh, that could, you know, that could really help students who are actually planning to start this fall or in the coming month, few months? Yes. Yeah, so, one other thing is, I recommend every student who is coming to the US is to use the power of networking, and because there is nothing like concept of mass recruitment in the US where right. companies come right. and they tend to hire a lot of students from the universities that doesn't happen a because we all need h1b sponsorship in the end yeah. so companies need to take that risk to hire a candidate on opt and then hope that they'll be selected in the h1b lottery so that's a big risk that they take yeah. although i mean most of the companies i mean they are willing to do that although it has reduced a little bit now but i hope by the time the students who are coming now they'll graduate in two years things will get a little better mm-hmm. so if they you leverage the power of networking by attending lots of national conferences career fairs beyond their school career fairs then that's going to definitely help them like there are multiple conferences which i used to be part of like society of hispanic professional engineers the national society of black engineers they are of different origin but they are very much diverse and they invite students of all background and origin to be a part of the society be an active member and then attend their national conferences which go on for like 3 to 4 days in a year for every society and 4 to 400 to 500 companies come there they tend to have multiple networking sessions career fairs and they also have direct interviews there so okay. i've had opportunities when i've been to those uh, events and i've had a one on one conversation with the hr and i was scheduled the first round of hr interview directly during the conference oh, okay. so that mm-hmm. is one way to get your resume directly to the hiring manager b- without having to go through the tedious process of being selected okay and other than that another thing i would recommend student is to know which companies are usually h1b friendly Okay. like there's a portal mm-hmm. which i tend to use which is myvisajobs.com okay in which they tend to say if a company has sponsored for h1b in the past year mm-hmm. so i can just search mm-hmm. with let's say amazon or google and okay. see how many if they're sponsored in the past for a particular role so okay. that way i'm not wasting much time in applying to companies which don't hire international students okay. let's say the defense companies like northrop grumman uh lockheed martin and others they they, they don't hire international students okay. so there is no point in applying to those even if you are a software engineer or an aerospace engineer right. there because those are for us citizen mostly okay 
So yeah, that that's definitely something you know worth knowing because that will actually save some students a lot of time and efforts uh, rather than wasting time behind. Although the job might seem lucrative or the company might seem good, but if they are not sponsoring any funds, then it doesn't make sense to apply. Yeah, and and students should be very honest about when they are. Sp- answering that question in the application like they ask like do will you now or in the future require sponsorship Correct. so for internships students some students simply say no because yeah they don't need sponsorship because they have cpt hmm. but a company tends to hire a student usually as an intern if on paper they can convert them to a full time and they usually want to see that they are keeping them in for the long run so Correct. students would still say yes that yes in the future i would need sponsorship for an h1b mm-hmm. because a lot of students tend to make that mistake and they say no and then they get an interview call and then they have that conversation there and they get uh, and like they are denied the offer because of their right. citizenship mm-hmm. okay uh, i think that's all from my side any anything else that you would like to add or we can Um yeah I mean in regards to employment I tend to get a, this question a lot from students as to if we can work off campus like in a restaurant or a cafe uh-huh, yeah. if I don't get a on campus job from day one and that's a sure shot no because it's against your F1 visa status I tend to hear that students say I heard from another guy in another in a senior that he's working in this restaurant I said well he's taking the risk and i tend to give this uh, like correlation to them that you can also drive without a driver's license probably if you're not caught Correct. but if you are caught then you are in serious trouble so Correct. are you willing to do that same way i mean a lot of people work under the books they don't get caught and they seem like oh we are completely fine but that's completely illegal you should only work on campus 20 hours a week during your regular classes and in the summer i think you're allowed to work up to 40 hours on campus if you don't find an internship yeah, right and if you do an internship obviously you it has to be directly related to your or somewhat related to your field of study yeah, right True. and you have to get it through the cpt or the pre completion opt so it's important to make sure those paperwork are done before somebody starts working and right. companies tend to understand that there are sometimes delays happening from the uscis like ead cards take time to get de- de- delivered so they are okay to wait sometimes if that conversation happens in advance that i'm waiting still mm-hmm. but for mm-hmm. cpt i don't think you need an ead but you need some sort of a work authorization i haven't done any internships on cpt okay i have only mm-hmm. done it on pre completion opt because of my situation back then okay so but yeah for cpt as well as for uh, as well as for internships you need either the cpt or the pre completion and same way for opt as well so before one last thing i wanted to say is before a student graduates depending on how his interviews are scheduled he should select the start date of the opt right so the earliest you can apply for an opt is 90 days before you graduate that is the earliest you can apply for it okay. and in that application you will have to put the start date as to when you want it mm-hmm. some students mm-hmm. tend to put it the immediate day after they graduate that is a little risky for people who uh, haven't had any secured roles or who haven't had interviews lined up and the latest you can put a start date is 60 days after your graduation right so if you are graduating in may 15th for a particular year your start date can be between may 16th and july 15th like right. just as a 60 days mm-hmm. and the latest they can uh, start a job is 90 days after your opt starts Correct. So this is very important because in those 90 days if you still don't find a job then you'll have to change your status or leave the country. Correct. So that's why it's very important to select your start date and of course I've seen students getting some sort of unpaid roles even in the university in the first year mm-hmm. of OPT just to buy more time sometimes. Correct. And while they keep applying for more roles. Mm-hmm. Yes. so these are something students should apply in a little bit smart manner i would say just to know what are the deadlines what timeline i have and how my interviews are lined up right right i think that is definitely something that you know, you know very many people are not aware of in fact many students who are actually even graduating and at the university don't kind of tend to 
think on those lines. So that is something very useful for yeah. students. Yeah. Yeah, this is something I hear a lot from students as to okay, when I can start with my OPT. Correct, right. And the first question I ask them is, how are your offers lined up? Do you have offers or do you yeah, have interviews right. coming yeah. up or is there nothing? So right. that way they'll have to assess accordingly and mm-hmm. put the start date. Okay. Okay, th- thanks, thanks a lot for joining. It was yeah, definitely very, very much. helpful and maybe we'll have some more conversations in the near future again. Sure, absolutely. And if there's anybody having having any follow up questions, they can connect with me in LinkedIn or they can sure, feel free to ask. Me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Bye. Bye.